my name is DB Pony, and you're listening to the MBS Show. Hello and welcome to the MBS Show, episode 51. I'm your host, Norman Sanzo, and I have no co-host because I'm flying solo this week. But I do have a guest, and my guest is DB Pony. Hi. Hey there, how are you? Tired. <laughs> oh my, I hope I'm not bothering you with late night interviews. Nah, it's barely late. I mean, yet. <laughs> but things are alright, don't, don't worry about it. It's a pleasure to be here, so. Oh, I hope I'm not bothering you because time nice. difference. <laughs> Relax, buddy. Just do what you need to do. True, true. I'm flying solo now. I'm a bit nervous. I got no idea what to do. <laughs> just, just be you. That's all you gotta do. I'll try, but I'm not sure that's a good idea. But anyway, before we start with the interviews and the whole show, um, you need to answer the four basic questions. Uh, consider them as card keys in Metal Gear. So, question number one is, who is your favorite pony? Rainbow Dash. I like her a lot. Rainbow Dash. Any reason why? Because she tries to act tough and in turn kind of works against her. <laughs> and I think that's kind of... I- that's kind of cute. I kind of like people. I like people who try to act tough, but they can't really act tough because they just got this cute side about them that they're oblivious to, or they're trying to cover up by acting tough. And I'm just like, ah, it just makes when she act when she tries to act tough, it just makes her look more adorable. So <laughs> kind of like that. I like people who are semi cocky of themselves a little bit. Okay, okay, that's an interesting fact. Um, that's the first I heard before the explanation, but awesome, awesome. What's your favorite episode then? It's still the Cutie Mark Chronicles. Uh, out of every episode that I've watched in the, in the entire three seasons, it still has to be the Cutie Mark Chronicles because you get a little closer into the characters' background stories. You find out a lot about every single character in that one episode, and you get to kind of follow the Cutie Mark Crusaders around, and they're adorable. So I had a lot of yay for that episode. So I wouldn't complain about that episode. So, I mean, that is a good episode. It shows the history of the main six and how they got their cutie marks. Yeah, it's a, it's a cute episode. I think it, it just it dwells into the characters' pasts a lot more, and it gets you a bit more close and personal with every single character, and you know a lot more about them in that one episode than I think in any episode. True, true. And we got a song. We got a song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So, um, question number three is, how did you become a fan of the show? At first, I didn't really like the show. In fact, I kind of ridiculed it because I thought it was, I guess, lacked for a better word, um, gay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I was dating somebody at the time who had really liked the show, and they're like, oh, you should really give it a chance. And I was like, no, I'm just, I'm not. It's, it's silly, it's nonsense, and I think you're all really stupid for watching it. And I tried watching the pilot episodes after caving in, and I did, and I, my initial opinion at the time was, nope, can't do it, sorry, just no possible way. And then I got into playing TF2 again, and uh, I used to play that game just constantly and constantly and constantly. And there were so many bronies playing TF2 that it was practically impossible to avoid seeing an MLP reference in every single game. So the more exposure I got from TF2 to ponies, the more it started to grow on me. And the more Gmod videos I watched, the more I saw there was more pony references in them. So the more I started watching pony clips... And then after a while, I was like, I kind of really like this. Uh, Maybe I should watch an episode. So I watched the random episode from season one. And then I watched the entirety of season one in a couple days. And then I started on season two, which was only about three or four episodes in. And uh, that's pretty much where it happened. (laughs) Just because of TF2. I knew Five Iron was right. TF2 is a pony game. (laughs) Yeah, it kind of is. You know, it really ha- what did it for me because there's just so much exposure to, to the show in, in that game. I honestly can say if I, if I hadn't played TF2 as much as I have had back then, I probably wouldn't be into the show right now. So Awesome, awesome. And my final question is, what do your family and friends think about your love for the show? My friends think it's weird. They think it's stupid, whatever. But one of my friends doesn't really care. I didn't even really tell them that I liked the show because, to be honest, there is no real reason to tell people I like the show because it's just a hobby and I keep my hobbies to myself. It wasn't something I felt I needed to confess to people. I mean, I'm gay, so and everyone knows that already. So I don't think telling them that I like a pony show is going to dr- dramatically change their opinions of me. It's like, oh, well, you love guys. Now you like a pony show? Well, that's just it. That, that crosses the line for me. I can't like you anymore. But, um... Uh, my friends don't care, and my parents don't care either. I mean, 
that nobody cares, and that's the way it should be. And I'm happy about that. So, so basically, it's just a show, and everybody should move on. Yeah, I mean, that's not to say that my parents and some of my friends don't feed my unhealthy obsession with the show. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they give me toys, and I'm like, "Ah, oh, that's cute. Thank you for being so thoughtful." But I mean, you know, it. Aside from that, no one really cares, and that's exactly how it should be. I don't force it on them. They don't, you know, they don't force their opinions on me. That's yeah, it. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. I mean, I think that's the proper way to handle stuff like that. If you try to push it on others like a religion, let's say J-Dub, nobody really wants to hear about it because it's J-Dub. Well, I mean, if they don't really care to hear about it in the first place, then, I mean, why tell them about it? It's, it's nothing that's going to really alter their experience with you. Aside from the fact that they're just going to think, uh, okay, whatever. I mean, you know, sometimes my friends tease me about it, but, I mean, you know, whatever. You chuckle, you laugh about it, you move on. And that's pretty much it, so... True, true. It's like anything. If they're interested, they'll ask you about it. Yeah, well, I mean, one of my friends attempted to try to figure out what the, you know, what the hoot was all about with the, with the show. And he messaged me that night, and he said, I can't do it. I tried watching some of the episodes. I, I can't understand it. I, I can't fathom how you guys like the show. I said, that's fine. <laughs> I, I didn't ask him to watch the show. He just couldn't understand why I liked it so much. So he tried to understand it by watching the show himself, and he, he couldn't like it. And, I mean, that's it. So, I mean, whatever. True, true. But that brings up a good, good point. Why do we like the show? Is it... I have my theories and all, but why do we like the show besides the whole thing about cute ponies? Because, personally, for me, I think it's the community. But why do we like the show? I try to look at it from the perspective of the creator of the show, Lauren Faust, and how she's pretty much just kind of a genius at what she does. True, true. I mean, it's kind of... And I know that there's kind of like a, a, a bit of a zero comparison about, from, about, you know, to what I'm about to make right now. But, I mean, if you kind of look at the Beatles and how much of, of a, an appealing sound they had to their music and how it just was universally liked by so many people, there was a big science behind what made their music so catchy and so likable in the first place. As with Lauren Faust's, you know, general technique and style with her drawings and her, you know her creative mind she just has this very very appealing style and it's it just seems so scientific to me because she uses these very appealing curves these very appealing colors and when they had asked her to design the show that to me is what really changed the show and changed you know a lot of people's lives because she designed the characters she created the look she created the universe of of this of the show and I think that's what really, really makes us like the show because there's just something about what she does that makes everything seem that much more magical. If anyone else had done it, I don't think the show would have been nearly as popular as it is today. That probably would have gotten a small following, maybe. I mean, that's not to say that it wouldn't have. I just think, theoretically speaking, it is all her. Uh, you know, you can say, oh, it's the animation, it's the characters, it's, you know, you can relate. And, you know, that's all true. But I hear that thrown around so much. When it all comes down to it, I just think it's really because Lauren Faust has such an appealing art style. It's so pleasing to the eyes, it's almost like a drug. <laughs> I really think it's just because of how she portrays that universe. I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge following for the Powerpuff Girls, there's a huge following for Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. I mean, everything she does is like crack. And I don't know why, but it's, it's just her. I don't know. True, true. I, I, I agree, I agree. Because um, if you remember the show, The Iron Giant, she was involved with that. And that show was pretty good, but it didn't got the hype that it deserved. Yeah. The so, Iron Giant. Yeah. Um, Vin Diesel played the giant. And the giant doesn't speak. <laughs> Vin Diesel talk in grunts. Awesomeness. Are we, talking, are we talking about the movie? Yeah, the movie, yeah. All right, because I was a bit confused for a second. Um... Yeah, that that was a great movie. I remember when I watched that back when I was a kid. That was a fantastic movie. Yeah, but it didn't and, get the hype that it needed. It, it, it was an okay movie, but it was like, meh, just there. And they set up sequel bait, which we all want to see, but never got a chance to experience the sequel. It was a movie. Yeah. I mean... I, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed it when I was a kid, and partially because I'm really into the whole mechanics kind of thing like when i was a kid i was insanely into trains and cars and stuff like that so seeing a big giant walking robot and and animated in in such a way and just the animation is so colorful and so smooth it was it was really pleasing 
very pleasing to me. So, I mean, as a kid, that that was awesome. I, I absolutely loved that movie. There was there's so much about it that made it great. So, I need to rewatch it, man, because from what I remember by memory, it's okay. But I I really need to watch it because from what I heard, it's good. I don't know. I thought it was a great movie. I think the combination of the CGI animation that they put on the Iron Giant himself. Like they, they put it, it was a weird CGI and actual drawing animation combination. It was interesting in between the actual animation that they do, and I really liked the 1950s um, Art Deco look they gave everything. I'm a really big fan of that time era, so the way they've captured that time era was just insanely appealing to me. So another big plus in the movie. So yeah, yeah. Un- understandable, understandable. So bef- let- let's move on before we tension into other stuff like big giant robots. So mm-hmm. um, moving on to the next topic is housekeeping. Next week we'll be holding our first year anniversary meetup. Come and join us in the celebration and join us for a live recording of episode 52. Be a live audience and interact with us and get the chance to win some swags. Um, we'll be meeting it up at The Curve at 12 noon on February 23rd. Come and join us in the fun. Links for additional information can be found in the show notes. So um, next week will be our 52nd episode and our first year anniversary. That's awesome. Yay! Thank you. I hope you can join, but now you're in the States, I don't think that's a feasible request. It's It might be a bit hard for me, yes. <laughs> but you're still invited. You're still invited. Everybody's welcome. Mm, I'll keep it in mind. Yay. <laughs> Plane ticket to Malaysia. How much is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, let's move on before I turn insane. Uh, next topic is news time. In today's news time, Equestria Girls rumored to be a spin-off series to My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. In the recent Kid Screen magazine, information pertaining to Equestria Girls has popped up. This new series is a spin-off of the original show, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. Nothing much is known, but from the information that is available, the series is going to feature the main six in human form. And the series is to set and the series is set to air in the spring of 2013. Equestria Girl is not going to replace the main series, but should be considered as a companion series to the already existing show. Links can be found in the show notes. So, um, DB, what do you think of this main six Equestria Girl human thing? Eh, I don't know. I have been paying as little attention to that as possible, to be honest. Not interested in the whole human pony thing? No, I am not. And if the sneak peeks that I saw were anything to go by, I definitely don't want to really see anything <laughs> having to do with that show. I don't know. It just does. I, I don't want an alternate version of what I am watching already. I mean, I watch other cartoons for a reason. It just doesn't seem appealing to me. I'll probably watch the first episode just to kind of be to have that initial. Yeah, I saw it, and then you know have a more valid opinion on it. But I don't know. It just isn't something right now that I'm very interested in okay. watching. So, okay, here's here's a kicker for you. Um, if it's done by the same writers, what do you what do you say? Would you give it a shot? And you think it'll be successful? I don't think it's going to be nearly as successful, or even marginally as successful as the My Little Pony show. What really made it kind of good in the first place is that the, all the characters are, you know, really pleasing to the eye. Like I said before, with the whole character design that Lauren Faust gave all these pony characters, I, the human portrayal of these characters that I'm looking at or that I have seen just do not look like anything appealing at all. Okay, and I mean, that's a big part of it for me. If I can't enjoy watching the cartoon, then it's going to be hard to stick around for, for the story, even if it is a good story. So, okay, I mean, even if it were the same writers and the same animators, I probably still would be have a hard time trying to get into it. Okay, okay, understandable. As for me, like I said, if it's from the same writers, I might give it a shot. And if it's for me, I watch it, but I won't be a huge fan of it because there's a lot of reasons why you should not turn um, ponies into humans. A lot of adult matured content stuff that I don't want to get into. Mm -hmm. I mean, a big part of my life has been cartoons and drawing and, you know, for the most part, drawing animals and you know, drawing them in anthropomorphic form or just drawing them in, you know, in their little feral selves or whatever. And I like what I can do with characters 
as far as them being animals goes, because I feel like I can portray their emotions a lot more and I have a lot more creative freedom with animals because it gives me a chance to be a bit more unique with the drawings. I've never really been that great at drawing humans. I never studied human anatomy that much. All the anatomy and all the skills I had from drawing just came from drawing a bunch of little animals over time. So to me, watching cartoons with animals in them and, you know, they're the focus of the show. It's like a big plus for me because I really, 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 really love the idea. I mean, not to say that I don't enjoy cartoons with humans in them because I've watched so much and I've enjoyed a lot of them, but I just think the main focus of this particular show is because they are all ponies. Just the fact that they're all going to be humans now to me just retains zero interest. So Okay, okay. It just kills it for you. Okay. A little bit. Yeah, as for me, like I said, I'll, I'll give it a chance. I'll give it a chance. But um, I asked some feedback from our audience and asked them what they think. And from Twitter, Grey Brother says... Uh, looks like they thought Monster High needed some competition. At least we'll still have him. I have to say, it's true. I, I took a look-see at Monster High, and it's kind of a short series setting dolls, but um, the whole show is about monsters. How do I put this? Um, you know classic monster creatures like werewolves, vampires, medusas, and whatnot? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's basically them in high school. Facing high school problems. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've watched a lot of shows like that. Degrassi. Yeah, it's 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 a show. It's a show. And from Facebook, Bernard Chan uh, says, if it's done with the same uh, funkiness as the main series, I guess it it'll work. But will they be as cute? That's the main question. Lol. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say about that, but I think there is, but. How cute can you go with um, human form people, right? Hey, you can make human characters cute. I mean, Powerpuff Girls. I, I know. mean, like, a lot of a lot of shows that make him, you know, human forms cute. I just think the character design so far for the main six in Equestria Girls just looks dumb. I don't know. And, and the name is I just find the name stupid too. Equestria <laughs> Girls. Okay, true. whatever. I don't know. True, true. But I mean, for me, I, I think it's kind of. It's naturally cute and forcibly cute. And this main six Equestria girls, I think they're going to force it somehow to make them look cute. Uh, I guess. I don't know. It just doesn't seem that appealing to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, we got a few more. And um, from Facebook, Daniel Anthony, this could be a ray of hope to clear the air. When we heard about the whole fiasco of humans in Equestria, this could be what they are really talking about. Only time will tell. Could be, could be, I'm not 100% sure. Human in Equestria. Uh, Some people do not want that to happen. I think human characters being in the show will kind of interfere with the magic of what makes the show special to begin with. Yeah. Uh, It is for fanfics. Um, Human in Equestria is for fanfics. Uh, Let us have our fun and you can have the official stuff. Please don't insert your officialness in our fanfics. (laughs) Okay, um, we got to... Um, I'm going. To, I'm going to just run through them uh, from Facebook. Now, file N Cube. He says, "Well, if it's true, then I'm going to give it a chance because it seems interesting and it's just a spin-off, so it wouldn't affect film. Yes, it wouldn't affect the main series. And if it doesn't affect the main series, then it's a good thing, right? Yeah. I mean, it's because it doesn't affect the main series. I don't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah." And moving on to the last two from Facebook, Daniel Atikasun says, Human MLP official Gajinkas. I love it. Ah, do you know what Gajinkas is? I have no clue what he means. <laughs> okay, so um, I did research on this and Gajinkas is a humanized version of something. You know all those um, like example of game console being humanized into cute girls? Oh, okay. Yeah, it. it's basically that. And nothing much to say about it. If he loves it, he loves it, I guess. And moving on to the last one from Dust Shine Elsman. Interesting. We'll see how it turns out. And I have to agree. <laughs> Interesting. We'll just have to wait and see then. We sure will. So let's move on to the next one because that one is kind of dying. Uh, Megan McCartney considers the season 3 finale as a three-parter. As many of you may have noticed, the season 3 finale is a single part episode. Many have said that the story for the third season could be expanded a bit more. Recently, Megan McCartney tweeted that she considered the season 3 finale to be a three-part episode. This could mean one of two things. 
The first being that the episode may have been cut down for time. The second is the story for the final episode for season three may carry over to season four as the first four sorry um as the season four premiere two part episode. Links can be found in the show notes. So um, DB, what do you think about this? Because my theory says a lot on this. Oh, it's confusing because I'm pretty much like under the assumption and the impression right now that this episode was it and that was it. <laughs> true, true. I mean, uh, from what I saw, is it and that's it, it. So it's going to be for the first one, um, time constraint, cut down to make it shorter. But it will be interesting if the whole theory of if this is it, season four will have some kind of continuation to that story. I think... Every episode in the My Little Pony season lineup has really relation to every other episode in one way or another. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, consistency with the story development. So I mean, either way, it's going to somehow relate because now there's been this dramatic change in a character. So you're going to see that drag over in the next episode. So there will be some continuality from it. But I'm not. Sh- there's not much to continue on from this last episode. Twilight solves a problem, she turns into a princess. It doesn't really become a second or third parter after that because the story's done, the lesson's been learned, it's mm-hmm. complete. All, what what can you do with the first episode of the fourth season now? Just start a new story. So that doesn't make it a second parter to the last episode, that just means that it's now the first part of either a episode or a two-parter and whatever they decide to do. I mean, that's, that's completely up to time to tell, but The last episode right now, to me, at least, you know, in my eyes, was a episode, and that was a, it's it's not a second or a, there's no second or third part to it. Okay, okay. Mm, Well, my theory went out the window, but here's (laughs) something I just remembered. Um, Do you know about the movie that's been planned to come out? I've heard about it, and by heard, I mean I've heard very small things about it. I haven't really paid much mind to it. And the thing I keep in mind is, like, a lot of the things that have been tossed around, I've seen, like, stuff about about it on Tumblr, and a couple of my friends have mentioned it, but I've never actually bothered to look into it myself because I've just been so busy taking care of other things. It's just like, yeah, I heard there's a movie coming out, but I don't know what it's about, so... <laughs> Yeah, same here. From what I understand, it could be involving humans. I don't know how. <laughs> let's hope not. It's the Equestria Girls thing. Oh, let's hope not. But um, what about this? If the season 4 premiere, two-parter or whatever it is, is a continuation from the movie? Uh, no, that's, uh, again, something that only time will tell because... I don't know. Usually when, usually when uh, developers or, you know, a, a company... Or, or a, a studio decides to make a movie to something, it usually retains its, its story to the movie. It doesn't really, like, go on afterwards in, in an episode. Like, it can, and there'll be subtle references, but I don't think they're going to make an entire movie and then, at the beginning of the fourth season, be like, oh, second and third part of the movie. Haha, <laughs> you've completed mm, the movie. I think it's maybe not like that, but to me, maybe it's kind of, hey, um, you're confused. Why is this character here? Why is this character there? And who is this new character? I do not know. Go watch the movie and then you understand. Eh, could be something like that. Mm, I guess. Like okay. I said, I, I believe it's just going to be a movie. And, and then after the movie, that's it. You, uh, you go on and watch the rest of the, the show. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic is MLP... FIM Season 3 Reviews. On this episode, we review Season 3, Episode 13, the final episode for Season 3, Magical Mystery Cure. So, DB, before we start reviewing, what do you think about this episode, the final episode for Season 3? It's good. I have nothing negative really to say about it, but I don't have anything extremely positive to say about it either. It was just an episode to me. Okay. I mean, some, peop- some people have evaluated things in the episode that have really touched them or got to them, and some people were very kind of indifferent about the episode. And, I mean, it was a good episode. I I enjoyed it. I thought a lot of the animation in some of the parts were, were, was impressive. I was like, wow, you know, some of the stuff here that they've got is pretty good. But uh, for the most part, like I said, the whole entire episode seemed like a big clutter. There's a lot of music, and I mean, there's no, there's, I, I don't have a problem with a lot of music, but... 
to me, the episode seemed more like a musical than an actual episode to me. And because there was so much they were trying to say within a short period of, you know, a short period of time, it just came off as rushed to me, and I thought it would have been better as a two-parter. Understandable. Um, interestingly enough, you said that this feels like a musical for you, because from what I read on Daniel Ingram's Facebook page, he said that um, Hasbro wanted it to be some kind of musical, and I can see it, because each act, there's a song, each act, there's a song, like... There's seven songs in this episode. People are saying, like, where are all the songs? Season 3 only has five songs? Boo! Well, five plus seven, that's, that makes what? A lot. I'm bad at math, even though I'm Asian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean... It's a, yeah, it, was, it, was, it was a good episode. Like, like I said, it's just that... I thought it could have been put into a two-parter because I felt like the story, for the most part, was just rushed. But, true, eh. true. I agree, I agree. I, I wanted more story, but with what we got, it's okay, I guess. Yeah, it was a good episode. Like I said, I, I didn't think it was great, but I didn't think it was bad. You know, True. it was good. So let's walk through the whole episode then. Um, I, I'll try to make it fast because uh, people have complained I take too long. So starting off the episode, we see Twilight bursting out of her library and singing. Um, this is a shock for me. Um, starting off an episode with singing hasn't been done before, right? I don't know. I have a feeling that it may have, but if it has, I can't remember the episode. Yeah, I don't know. It was a bit of a surprise, I guess. I mean, yeah. she burst out singing, and I was like, oh, well, look at that. <laughs> song! So, um, what do you think of this song? The first song, what was it called again? Oh, boy. Everything is Fine, or something like that. Something like that, I don't remember. But what do you think of that song? It's okay. It was a MLP song. What, I, what I'm finding, and I don't know if maybe this is... And I, this is a bit of my own personal, like distaste of the music from MLP so far. It's something that I've noticed and it's partially because I'm a musician and I've kind of caught on to it. A lot of people may have caught on to it too, but I mean, it was something that I picked out that Dan Ingram does a lot and it was like one of those things that I was like, okay, it's kind of iconic to MLP music, but at the same time, it's like he uses it a lot. There's this synthesizer patch that he uses in literally all of his all the music in, in MLP. I don't know what it is it sounds like a weird, like, waspy kind of a synth lead, but it was used in this song, and when I heard it, I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's that it's that synth lead again. <laughs> so I, I was just like, huh. I was like, that's interesting. And uh, for the most part, like I said, I have no real complaint about it, but it's used a lot, and I'm just like, that seems to be something that Dan Ingram likes to do a lot. So if I had any, like, critique for the for the writer of the music of this song, is that he uses that synth patch a lot. <laughs> I don't know why he does. I mean, he just really likes it. And if he does, whatever, good good for him. I, it's just something that I wouldn't do. Okay. Uh, I wish I could hear it. I, I wish I noticed about it because I am not a musician. I am a podcaster. And music is kind of blur for me. But um, maybe some of our listeners may agree with you. And I hope they do and tell me about it because I want to know what is this synth. It's just it's just a synth lead that he uses in a lot of the music, and I just noticed it again, and I was just like, ah, this is the synth lead that he's used in a couple of songs, like, you know, Art of the Dress. It's very prominent in that song, and he's even used it in a couple of the Cutie Mark Crusader songs. It's just one of those things I noticed. I was like, ah, he's, like, he's using it again. I think I may have caught on to what you're saying, but I need to double-check it personally for me. Yeah. And yeah, uh, let's move on to the next scene, and the next scene is when Cutie Mark switch. Um... So, here's something interesting. We see all the main, uh, well, the main five cutie marks switch around. And we got to see Rarity has Rainbow Dash's cutie mark. And Applejack has Rarity's cutie mark. And so on. So, um, we got a song. <laughs> oh, God. One song after another. Like, this song, the cutie mark song. Um, kind of nice. Has mm, I don't know. I mean, what do you think of this song? Because I got no idea. To me, it's a song. I like it. I thought it was good. It's, it had a theatrical feel to it. I like the I like the music that was composed behind that, and I thought the uh, some of the lyrics were funny. <laughs> so I thought the concept of a cutie mark being switched and completely altering the character's interests was interesting, to say the least. <laughs> True. But I have this theory in my head. Um, it goes something like this. Okay. Your cutie mark has changed and whatnot. And they say that, oh, I've always had this cutie mark. So um, it's my destiny to 
make dresses and change the weather patterns and whatnot. But here's the thing. Don't you, don't you feel or think that if you're brought up in a certain environment, said QT Mark has um, developed, say if you're, your interest is in fashion making and you make dresses and you feel that you want to make dresses and you have your making dresses cutie mark. So um, the whole thing with them saying that, oh, I've always had this cutie mark of uh, making people laugh, even though I'm a shy person. Uh, don't, don't, don't click with me. But since it's a spell and nobody really remembers anything, eh, for me, it's kind of strange. It's the fact that it was a spell, and it's the fact that it didn't really not it. It not only did it change really their cutie marks and their interests, it changed their mentality because yeah. they believed firmly that that was their new that well that that that's what they've been doing all their life, and mm-hmm. getting frustrated that they couldn't seem to do it right, even though they felt like they were. I don't know. I found the con- I, I just found the concept interesting. It's like. It's like if somebody, it's like if somebody switched com- interests with me, like I don't know, like maybe somebody's really really good at fishing, and all of a sudden my interest for music went to them, and their interest for fishing went to me, and I was like, oh man, I'm gonna go fishing, and I'm just screwing up, and I don't know how to fish, and that guy's like, oh man, I really had this great song, and I want to write it, and they don't know how to play an instrument, and it sounds horrible. And that, that's pretty much like what it was. It's just like it's not even like they they switched skills. They switched the mentalities for what they were interested in, and they were so bad at it that they were just like, "Why? Like, you know, why can't I do this right? It's what it's what my cutie mark is. It's what it's telling me I do, but for some reason I can't do it, and they're freaking out about it." You know what? That that's a good way to say it because I've been confused because in my head, it's kind of the whole mentality issue of. If if all my life I say that I've been brought up to, let's just say I'm a unicorn and I, my destiny is to change the cloud. So wouldn't make me wouldn't that make me better if I if it's been all my life? But the way you said it is making more sense now. Well, it's because the cutie marks are being used metaphorically to explain an interest. Or in this case, a destiny. Like I said, what basically happened in the episode is the spell that Twilight casted switched around the interests, or the cutie marks per se, of the characters. It's kind of like if I hung out with six friends and a fr- one of my friends casted that spell, and all of a sudden, for each of my friends, all of our interests got switched around. Like instead of me liking music and want to write music, now all I wanted to do was, you know, write fan fiction. Talk about. Not even that, like talk about comics all day or, or, you know, like film, film a video. And in my head, I firmly believe, yes, this is what I'm supposed to do and it's going to be great. But the skills aren't there because I've never done it before. So when I try to do it, it just turns out to be a huge disaster. And I'm like, well, how can this be? This is what I like. This is what I've always wanted. This is what I've always done. How come I can't do it now? You know, and it's, it's confusing yourself. And then the other person again. You know, my other friend would be interested in music, and he'd be like, oh, I want to write this tune. I got kind of like a cool tune, let me write it. And it turns out to be horrible. And they're like, why is it horrible? You know, I, this is what I do. Like, how, how can this be? How can, you know, th- this is just impossible. And that's why the characters in the show are freaking out, because metaphorically their cutie marks or their minds are telling them, this is what I do, but... Why can't I do it right? And they're becoming completely upset about it because they're like, it's just not working. You know, what do? <laughs> so, <laughs> True. you know, so it was up to Twilight to switch their mentalities back around on, on the on the issue. And she had to remind them, no, this is your skill. This is what you're good at. And once they were like, I don't know, I've never done this before. And then they try it and then they're like, oh, hey, look, I've got a knack for this. And then she's like, yeah, there you go. And she throws the element of harmony on them. And then all of a sudden their brains reset. And they're like, ha! To lock it down, to lock it down. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's that's that was the interesting part of the episode for me. You know, how they kind of metaphorically represented their talents, you know, through the cutie marks. But, you know, it's, that was just, that's just my way of perceiving. I, I have to say so. that um, with that, I, I kind of have more insight on how they're trying to tell the story because to me it's like huh why would they wouldn't that mean their personality ah, ah, it's just a big hole of confusing for me because I, I've been saying this a lot like if you're brought up as a 
rock farmer and then like you never discovered how to party wouldn't that make your cutie mark ability about finding gems or rocks or whatever it is and then like ah it is all confusing but yeah like i mean like i said it's their skills didn't switch over from one to the other because if that were the case then they would know how to do it Uh and they'd be and you know if along with the cutie mark came the skill then they would say okay and then rarity would suddenly know how to do everything correctly but because it is only the cutie mark and it is the only the interest and they're trying to execute it but they they don't have the skill required to do it they're doing it completely wrong therefore ruining everything Mm. so I, I get what you mean I get what you mean it, and it's a very interesting fact because rarity's passion is for um, making fashion and whether patterns are not her forte <laughs> yeah exactly but one thing why did Twilight Sparkle cast a spell without even understanding the whole reason behind the spell because she's Twilight <laughs> uh, I, I, Twilight opened the book and Princess Celestia said Twilight, there's a spell. It's kind of not completed. I think you should just read it. So she said, ah! She turns to the page and she goes, oh, here it is. And by reading it, accidentally casts the uncompleted spell. I don't think that Twilight accidentally, she purposely did it. <laughs> because like, ooh, a spell, what does this do? I guess, but it didn't. It, if she had known it was a spell and that she could cast it, and it was a completed spell, I have a feeling she would have been like, alright, well then let's cast it. But she turned to the book and said, oh, look, here it is. And then started, and knowing in her mind it was an incomplete spell, I don't think she really knew that it was supposed to do anything. So when she read it, she was like, huh, it didn't do anything. It's probably because it's incomplete. I guess that's why Princess Celestia wants me to complete it. Un- you know, But in the process, not really knowing that she actually did cast it and it changed everything. And that was how she completed it the spell by going through the experience and yada 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 yeah true true but um there's a line in the show that says twilight cast a spell like um i cast a spell to see what it does but it does nothing so she knew that it was an incomplete spell she knew that it might have repercussions she just wanted to see what happened (laughs) oh twilight you chaos maker so after twilight getting emo and stuff we get another song from twilight and this song was pretty good (laughs) Oh, there's a lot of songs in this episode, which is fun and good. Song for that one, what do you think? The kind of sad song. It's more poppy than the rest of the other songs that, that were written. Yeah. It had a more pop, popish aspect to it. They used a lot of different voice harmonies and a lot of different voice layerings in it that were very hookish and, catch, and catchy. So that was that was cool. The song could definitely be turned around to be more poppy. But, uh, oh, dubstep. It was good. Nah, not dubstep. But you know, the fandom will find a way to do that, and I won't listen to it because I'm not a big fan of that music. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, so, song good. What do you think about the True True Friend song? Like it? Hate it? Or just meh? Yeah, it was cute, I guess. I mean, it's a song that, you know, went to kind of finish and kind of tell the story a little bit. So, it was it's just one of those things I listened to. I didn't have too much to say about it. It's okay. just another song. And then after all that, we get to see them completing the spell, and Twilight got blown up. <laughs> Finished spell got blown up. I didn't see that one coming. And we get to see Celestia sing. Um, Nicole Oliver's voice is really good. That's that's all I have to say. She had a good voice. That was a, was a bit of a treat to hear her sing. I yeah. do gotta admit that when Twilight disappeared and there was nothing but a black mark on the floor, I kind of laughed a little louder than I should. <laughs> oh, me I just, I just... I just thought it would have been funny at the end of the episode there. <laughs> it's like, the, like she, she, she's turned into a, a black pile of just ashes, and they're like, oh my god, what did we do? And then the episode just ends, and it's like, my little pony. <laughs> I, I would have laughed pretty hard. I'm like, ah, that's the end of the episode. <laughs> that would be so much fun. And then, no, you, you want to make people even mad? It says, to be continued. <laughs> that just, that just ends the episode there. It's like, and, and when season four begins, it's like, well... Ponyville is never the same after we kill Twilight. Like, I, I don't know, like, that, it would have been funny if they just ended the episode there, but that's just, you know, me and my sick, malicious mind. Anyway. Uh, I, I have to say, it's funny, it's funny. Uh, but no, we didn't get that ending. Twilight becoming another cor- and the coronation. After the coronation, everybody's happy, and celebrations are there. Everybody's happy. What can I say? Yeah, we got Luna. Luna's fun. And she, she made an appearance. <laughs> She made her appearance. Uh, so, that was season three. I like it, and you're indifferent to it, right? 
Oh, I like season three. I didn't say I didn't like season three. Sorry, um, I just, I, I just thought the episode was could have been a two parter and would have been way better. So yeah, so the season finale, we, we, we both like it, but we both have our opinion that it could be better. Yeah. So um, what are your final thoughts on it? The episode as a whole and the whole season as a whole. Whole season was pretty good. I, I enjoyed the season. The episode I watched today, I, like I said, it was good, but it wasn't great, and it wasn't and it wasn't bad. I just thought if they had if they had time to make it a two parter, would have would have been a little bit better. But because they were going after the whole musical theatrical kind of a feel, they I guess they felt it was only necessary to have it in a twenty two minute time frame. So uh, yeah, they pulled they pulled it off pretty well. I thought it was a good episode, but in the end, it just felt like an episode to me. It didn't feel mm-hmm. like a season finale. So okay. Les Mis is five hours in theaters, man. Like, Les Mis, five hours. I think you guys could do more. <laughs> Although, I guess I guess the only part of the episode that felt conclusive to me and it felt like it was a finale was when they were, uh, when Twilight and Princess Celestia was walking through what everyone has appropriately dubbed the Twilight Zone. <laughs> and um, it shows all those windows of what's going on, of what's happened during her past and, like, what has been done so far in the show that felt that kind of gripped my heart a little bit because it also felt like a window into what i've experienced and it's like oh wow look it's kind of all coming back to you now and it's like you've grown with the show and now you're watching twilight grow into something a bit more you know a bit more important so it was like oh wow look it's it's, th- it's a throwback, really, and it's like, it kind of gives you a chance to be like, oh, wow, so this is what's happened, and now it's all come down to this. And and that's, I got I kind of got that feeling when I watched that part, so that's the only real part that felt really final to me and conclusive, but for the most part, the entire episode just felt like an episode. That scene was really heart-touching, because we get to see Twilight grow up, we, we got to see Twilight become the pony that she is now, because first starting off, she landed in Ponyville. She's socially awkward and didn't care for friends. Now she's an eloquent princess of friendship. Yay. Well, um, my personal views on the episode is there's a lot of songs, which is good. And I like the story. Eh, nothing much to complain about. I mean, could be longer, but uh, it, it, for what it is, it's good. Um, complaints, obviously, there is nothing's perfect. And for the whole season... I have to say, season three um, ended with a bang. Everything was really entertaining. Everything was really, really done well. Um, I have to say, I like it. I like season three. Would I say it's my favorite season out of all, of all three? Yeah, I put it in last place because there's a few seasons that are better. But to compare it like that, it's not, not fair really. Because season three only has 13 episodes and the first two has 26 so it's kind of not fair to rate it that way. Uh, but uh-huh. anyway, um, so if you were to give it a score out of five, what would you give it, DB? A three. A three. Yeah, for me, I'll say it was not as awesome as the previous episode. So uh, I, I, I'll say it's a four because of all the songs. So uh-huh. let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic is guest time. And in today's guest time, we have DB Pony. So DB, how are you? Uh, are you enjoying yourself? I always enjoy myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that could be taken in so many ways. Taken in the least disturbing way. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, DB, mind introducing yourself to the people who might not know you or know what you do? I am a young adult who lives in New York and writes music, and just so happened to write music based off of the My Little Pony franchise. <laughs> and uh, I really enjoy it. And I go under the name DB Pony. And if you haven't heard of me, feel free to look out my YouTube or go to my Tumblr where I interact with all of the fans. Awesome, awesome. So, first question is, how did you get your name and DB Pony? What does it mean? I woke up one day, ate some cereal, and I said, DB Pony, it's a good name. Nah, that's not how it happened at all. The name was a process, actually, uh, because there was a certain point in my My Little Pony um, adventure where I said, yeah, you know something? People are making music in this fandom, and it's kind of inspiring me to make music myself because I've been in a lot of bands, and I have had a lot of relative experience making music, and I really liked the show that much that I thought I could write some music about the show, and I think it would be awesome. So... 
I decided at this point, well, if I'm going to, I need to create a name that's going to be memorable. It needs to be a name that when people hear something relative to it, they'll think of me. And uh, it just had to be an iconic name at the same time. And it had to be easy to say. So I had to keep all this in mind when creating the name. And I was like, it needs to be relative to music. So in some way, shape, or form, it had to be relative to music. So that's when I and that's when I was I was sitting down at work one day. I work at a music shop, by the way. Oh, um, okay. I was sitting down at work, and I was trying to think of a name. And I thought DB is decibel, which is the phys- which is a rating for physical quantity in anything really you can use it for um in in music it's used to basically measure the gain in amps it can be used to measure the levels in a certain frequency or volume level it depends on what you're doing so that's the you know the rating quantity is decibel and that's what's used or as it's more commonly known as db which is a lowercase d and a capital b And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I called myself Decibel Pony? So I started looking up other people's names to see if the name was taken. And it has been taken. Somebody has called, had called themselves Decibel um, or Decibelli, whatever the name is. So I was like, oh, well, the name's already kind of been taken. But uh, then it kind of came to me that they didn't, they didn't, they weren't portraying the name the way that I had planned to. So... I didn't eliminate the possibility of the name. Instead, I went home and I tried to figure out a different way of presenting it. So I took the D and I took the B and I used a Helvetica format and I kind of manipulated the D and the B to come together. So it was all one symbol and I was like, ah, it looks cool. Then I thought, well, if I call myself DB Pony, I can manipulate the P into the icon and that would make it even more cool and more iconic so then i did that and i was like yep that's what it's gonna be it's gonna be db pony so that's initially how the name was born it was a bit of a process but i wound up coming to it and uh i wound up creating something that was very memorable and a lot of people know the name now so i I think i did a good job with the name (laughs) yeah i have to say it's awesome because uh, the whole logo for your tumblr db pony it looks awesome and like it's I have to say it's awesome, like how you said you manipulated the whole DB thing together. It's just awesome. I, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Um, the person who designed the um my my Tumblr stuff, his name is Vex. Uh, I think uh, he has his, his name is a bit extended than that. I think it's like uh Vex three. It's V E X X three. So if any, he creates wallpapers too and stuff. He's a he's a, he's a good digital artist. So. If anybody was interested in looking up his stuff, feel free to look up that name. But he's the one who designed the Tumblr background. I commissioned that from him. Uh, oh, awesome, awesome. But yeah, no, it's, it's, I like what he did with it. It's pretty good. Yeah, I, I agree because it looks awesome. It just looks awesome. Mm-hmm. So um, while looking at your YouTube, uh, I noticed that most of your songs, uh, I, I wouldn't say poppy, but it's kind of uh, pop rock. W- would you agree? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, the style of music that most appeals to me and is, in my opinion, the catchiest. I like music that's upbeat. I like music that's very happy. I like music that makes people hopeful. And I feel there's a way to do that when you're writing it. And if you use the right chord progressions and you use you know, the right sound and you have the right elements in the music, you can make it something very memorable. And... Uh, when I when I write my music, I try to make it as poppy and as um, happy as possible, and, um, and that's that's the general uh, you know th- that's that's the general kind of thing that you're going to be able to hear from a lot of the music that I write. It's that it, it has it has it's always going to have a hook. There's always going to be something that's going to get stuck in your head, and uh, I do it purposely because <laughs> I want all of you to suffer. <laughs> oh, trust me, I suffer through all of them. I suffer through all of them, and I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I mean, like, Miles uh, featuring Ellie Monty. That one, I, I have to say, oh, I love this one. Oh, I seriously do. And the whole Sweetie Belle song, oh, God, I love that one. There's a lot to love. I, if if I'm trying not to control my fanboyness right now, I would gush all over. <laughs> the uh, Miles is actually the... Uh... I think I think next to Wonderbolt, Miles is probably the most popular song on my list right now. Yeah, I have to say... Um, um, not including your first song, Sweetie Belle, um, it got 53,000 views. That song will have the most views at some point. It's because uh, it it's only it's only been up for about three months now, and uh, 
with the amount of time it's been up and the amount of time that Sweetie Bell, Oh Sweetie Bell has been up, Miles has accumulated the same amount of views as Oh Sweetie Bell in a shorter amount of time. And it's only going to be a matter of time before Miles goes ahead of views on Oh Sweetie Bell. Um, in my personal opinion, I believe that. Uh, so, I, I can and, see it, uh, I can see it. Wonderbolt will probably at some point get past Miles as well because Wonderbolt only got... You know, Wonderful got 33,000 views in only three or two weeks. <laughs> so, I mean, that song is going to pass miles at some point, too. Good songs. I, I, I enjoy them, and I'm very proud of the, mu- the, the work I do musically. I uh, There's always room for improvement, and I'm always trying my best to improve on my production skills and my, uh, my playing skills and my writing skills. But from what I produce and the amount of fun that I have doing it and the amount of... Uh, experience that, that I get from doing it, it's something that I'm, that I'm pers- I, I get a lot of personal fulfillment from it, and a lot of the feedback that I get, and a lot of the people who tell me that they get inspired by my music, that they listen to it, you know, on their iPods and stuff like that, it, it really touches me to hear that, because I have never in my life thought that I would impact people in such a way with my music, and a lot of people sometimes go through their entire lives not going, you know, we not not being able to witness or feel that with their music. So I consider myself very, very fortunate that I've been able to actually reach this many people. So it's something that I, I, I'll never take for granted. Yeah, I have to say, for me personally, I, I consider myself really lucky to have found your music because I enjoy all of them, man. Like, I don't want to say this, but Miles is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh. It was a great song. I, 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 I like that song, too. It was... Uh, when I completed and I released it, I was very proud of that one. I and I was showing a coworker when I, the, the song during the writing process, and he kind of told me too. He was like, "This song is going to be your best." He goes, he, "I think this one's going to really stick out with people." And he definitely is right. And I think I think what really made it a really really memorable song is the fact that I got Ellie Monty on it, and she's such a treat to listen to. She's such a talent. I she's so incredible, and I think she really she, she really makes that song what it is and I couldn't I couldn't have been happier with the fact that she was on it she did an outstanding job and I think she really needs to, to get a lot more credit for what she does I and I really hope she gets a future in doing something like this because she's she's the sweetest person that I know and she just does a lot of fantastic work and she's what's made my past two tracks so far with Pony Music really stand out she's just got a nice touch and it's like a nice spice on what I'm cooking and it's, it's just great I love having her on my tracks true true you said two tracks um, is there one coming out soon with her involved Wonder- she's in Wonderbolt really no huh. she, she voices Spitfire oh I thought when you said two it's like huh two what where how when Oh yeah, there's there's two songs that she's in on on my YouTube page. She's in she's in Wonderbolt. And she's in Miles. She only she doesn't really sing in Wonderbolt. She does uh, voice acting in, in Wonderbolt. She voices Spitfire. Um, but the fact that I had I was able to actually get her to do that and that she portrayed the character so well, it's it, it really it brings that much more magic out of the music because at that point it doesn't just seem like a song. It seems like something coming straight from the show. And if you're able to lead people to the illusion or to the, you know, to the realm where, wow, this music is not only fan music, it almost feels like it's coming from the show because you've portrayed it in such a way, that's really what's going to hook people on to listen to your music, is getting the music to feel as closely relatable to the show as possible. Okay, because um, I thought it was a snippet from the show and then you acted over it and I'm like, oh. Nope. Nope, it's all completely originally acted. It's uh, it's inspired by dialogue from the show, but uh, all the acting parts in in that in that particular song, they're all done by by creatives in this fandom. Um, and Ellie Monty voiced Spitfire. So the fact that you didn't think she was on that track kind of proves how great she is because you couldn't tell. So that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well. Um, I have to say all the songs are awesome. Um, there's nothing bad I could say about it. I mean, um, I'm just going to play Devil's Advocate here and say that um, Miles is a great song, but only one complaint is I had a confusing time um, differentiating you and Ellie Monty. I've only heard two people say that, and I'm going to be completely honest with you and the other person, wherever they are in the world. I have no idea how you can confuse the two voices. <laughs> well, um... And I, I'm not. I'm not saying you know 
that it's not that it's not possible, but um, because we both have high registered voices and we both have a very high key in singing, it's just that her voice sounds a lot more femaleish, <laughs> and so I, I didn't really. When when you and the other one person that is nameless at the moment, because I that was a comment I read a long time ago, you know, had mentioned, oh, I can't tell the difference between your voice and Ellie Monty's voice. I was just like, well, how? She's singing Applejack, and I'm singing me. Yeah. So I don't know. It's it's something I don't quite understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of at first, but um, how do I put this? For me, I think I might be going deaf, but that's just me. But I think it's kind of I need to be in that zone and hear it really properly and I can tell the difference because um, Ellie Monty has that um, sudden twang to her singing there is a very sudden change in the voices when uh, she kicks in which is the only reason why I'm saying it's kind of hard for me to imagine how anyone can mistake her voice for mine um, and like I said it's not something that I'm saying is impossible because some people kept saying oh wow Matt your you're, you know, your impersonation of Applejack is great and I'm like that definitely is not me <laughs> But, you know, hey, it's whatever, you know. The majority of everybody was able to tell that it was her. So, I mean, I don't feel like it's too big of an issue. It's stuff, you know, it, little things like that I keep in mind when I'm, when I'm doing other songs. I mean, it doesn't ruin the song, but eh, for me, like I said, I might be going deaf, but I still enjoy the song. And it gives me a, how is it, Wes Waldo kind of feeling like, where is she? And I need to listen to it carefully. Oh, there she is, and I can appreciate it even more. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I'm seriously. Uh, when I say that Miles is my favorite song, I mean it. Um, it's not uh, brown nosing you or anything. Like seriously, Miles is a good song, and I love it. <laughs> um, right. oh, that's cool. Thank you a lot. Yeah, and by loving it, I have to pick on it like any good parents would pick on their child. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. That's how crazy I am. Uh, so, wow, crazy. so I noticed that you started off your music with um, doing the Cutie Mark Crusaders and One Rainbow Dash, obviously Rainbow Dash being your favorite. But um, why start off with the Cutie Mark Crusaders first? Uh, it was a coincidence, really. Oh, really? I didn't, I didn't plan it. A lot of people thought that I planned it and it became sort of a thing after that because, you know, I released Oh Sweetie Belle and people were like, oh, it's a song about Oh Sweetie Belle, cool. And then I was writing the next song, and I was writing the lyrics, and I was like, uh, I was like, who should I write about? So then I decided to write about Scootaloo, because I thought the song fit her attitude and the lyrics I was writing closely related to her the most. So I thought, all right, Scootaloo. And I, school was a good subject because of September, and everybody was going back to school, and everybody doesn't like school. So I thought, all right, cool, I'll write about that. And then after I wrote that song and I released it, people started saying, oh, man, an Apple Bloom song's coming next. I can feel it. And I was just like... But I have no song written for her. So I was almost going to, you know, I was almost kind of like, I don't think I'm going to write a song about her because (laughs) I don't know what to write about Apple Bloom. And that was a great experience because it's really really helped me in my writing skills, you know, being able to write about the characters. So then after I wrote, you know, Miles and then I released that song, everybody was like, the trilogy is complete. You know, it's awesome. You wrote about the Key Mark Crusaders first and I wonder why you did that. And, you know, I told them... You know, I told a lot of people, you know, the reason why I did it is because they're great characters. I love I love all three of them. I think they're awesome characters. And I think it's a great way to, it's great it's a great way to start writing music because the characters are instantly relatable because everybody at some point in their life kind of went through all the similar feelings of yearning to have something as a child or wanting to grow up. It's something so relatable and it's something that people wish they can get back to doing again because, you know, being an adult kind of sucks when you get to it and you yeah. want to have that innocence back and you want to have that sense of wonder that they have so i liked writing the music about them the most because it was a nice way to kind of celebrate the childhood i once had and it was a good way to get back to that somehow so and i feel for the songs all three because like oh sweetie well is a love song from i think your perspective to sweetie well is that true no absolutely not Sorry. and everybody seems to confuse that for some reason or is uh, that your oc something? which is something I'm going to clear up right okay. now. Uh, the song was written kind of on the spot, and it was written while I was shaving, and <laughs> the only reason why I decided to record the song and release it was because the first song I had planned to release was going to be a cover, and it did not work out how I wanted it to at all. So I decided, I don't want to do the cover, I just want to have fun with an original song. 
So I recorded it, and I thought it'd be kind of cute if my character had a crush on O Sweetie Bell, and he's singing the song to the character. That would be cute. So I decided to write it from a two-character perspective, and I thought I didn't want to make my character a little, you know, I didn't want to make my character young, because, you know, then the song would be two young ponies singing about love, and that just didn't seem theoretically possible to me, because I don't believe kids at that age really know what love is True, and that true. can be disputed, but I'm not getting into that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I decided, well, I'm just going to make Sweetie Belle older. So I drew her with a cutie uh, mark, and, you know, then I drew my character in there, and he's, like, you know, in lustful love with her, and I thought, that's funny. So then I decided to record the song, and the song is really immensely catchy, and it has a really, really big hook, and as somebody once said about the song, it has a bit of an earworm to it. It gets stuck <laughs> in your head. So... That's the reason why I wrote the song. I myself have absolutely no attachment to Sweetie Belle as a character. I am not in love with the character. Uh, I never, I never had any feelings like that for the character. She's a fictional horse. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I phrase, uh, maybe I worded it wrong. It's your OC, but okay. So um, the way you write for that song, O Sweetie Belle, is you advance Sweetie Belle to an older age where she's appropriately lovable, so that, that, or for, appropriately for love. It made it better because if my character singing at his age was singing to a child, it would make it come Creepy. off as a very, very awkward song. And to some people, it still comes off as an awkward song because, as you mentioned before, people perceive the song as I have love for the character, but I don't. It's a fictional love song about two characters, and one character just so happens to have a crush on the character. This is the reason why I hate this song, by the way. I don't like Oh Sweetie Belle. I think it's one of the worst songs I've ever written. <laughs> uh, to be honest, it, it's a, it's okay song. It's okay song. I mean, uh, my favorite is Crusaders is Sweetie Belle, so I can I can relate. But um, from your point of view, while people don't understand the concept of OC, um, I, I can understand. I can understand why you don't like it. <laughs> You know, I don't dislike the song because people perceive it wrong. If people perceive the song wrong and they think that I have love for a character or a child for that matter, then they are just sorely mistaken and they really need to just rethink and stop assuming, you know, that I am in love with a, with a child. Okay. okay. It's def- definitely not the case. But uh, the reason why I don't like the song is because I feel it was rushed. I don't like the way I, I mixed it. And it's just so different from the rest of my other songs. It's a love song. It's, you know, it's a character saying, oh, man, I'm in love with this character, and this is why. You know, the other the other songs that I had written are of such different contrast. You know, Lessons is about why Scootle doesn't like school. Miles is about how, you know, Avalon wants something so bad, but she can't have it, and she has to wait. And then Wonderbolt is about aspiring and doing what you want to do without abiding by the strict standard that people place upon you. Because if you think outside the box and you do things the way you want to do them, you'll become what you want to become. You just got to believe in yourself. Every single other song after Oh Sweetie Belle had a deep message behind it and a deep meaning. And a lot of people were able to relate to it. Oh Sweetie Belle is just a catchy little tune about why another pony loves another pony. So, you know, the song holds a bit of a lesser meaning than my other songs it aside from it just being terribly catchy okay i can understand i can understand and it's your first creation on your youtube page so um that feeling of oh this song is terrible is there i understand it's like me with my first episode it sucks <laughs> oh so that's my previous episode but who's counting so you said that you draw your own album covers for your album for your songs i do I draw all the album cover artwork for all my songs <laughs> Uh, so not only do you sing and record music, you draw. Wow, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And from the looks of your album art, it looks really good. Thank you. I, I it's, it's weird. I'm pretty sure you've heard of the, of the, uh, the saying, an artist is his own worst critic. I am more content and more happy with what I produce in music. And I mean... I'm not saying I'm content with where I am. You know, there's always room for improvement. I'm constantly striving to be the best that I can with music. But I'm always a lot more happier with what I put out in music than I am in my drawing ability. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though I have a lot of people telling me that my art is good, I uh, I constantly down myself in my art a lot more than I do my music. So it's uh, it's just one of those things that it's like I can't even I can't even say that my art skill is good because I. Uh, I'm just that so I'm just that insecure with my own art skill. Oh, okay. Um, um, if you can say it, I'll say it. It looks good. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> 
but uh, I, I do, I do draw all the art for my, uh, for my, um, for my song covers, and uh, I think that's another thing that makes the uh, the DB Pony music lists a little more unique. Is that not only are you getting a new song, you're getting a new picture to go along with it, and I think that's something else that people really look forward to because it gives that it gives the music that kind of a, an extra touch. So uh, I do all all the drawing for my my music, and uh, I've had other, I've had people before you know ask me if the you know they if I needed anybody else to draw music for my you know my music. And I mean, I've had some pretty good artists ask me, but um, I always wind up telling them that you know I do the art myself, and that, you know, although I really appreciate their offer, you know, I, I can't, yeah, I don't really. You don't feel. I, I understand. I, it's a yeah, feel thing. I don't. It's, it's hard to say without without coming off as like a really for like pretentious person. I I don't need any of the artists to draw art for me because I do it myself, and I prefer it that way. I'm not saying that they, you know, that their art is not good enough. Because a lot of their art is great, and they would, you know, it would be a lot, you know, it would be great for other people's music and stuff like that. But uh, for what I do particularly, I, I kind of like the consistency that I have with my music and the art that goes along with it. I just prefer to do it that way. Um, okay. The, you, know, the, you know the saying, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Do it yourself. Yeah. Exactly. I understand, and, I understand the feeling because um, same with me. Uh, once I gave editing de- uh, duty to one of my co-hosts for one episode, and I didn't like it, and f- from now on, it's just me and me alone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm not saying that, you know, art, there, there's not an artist out there that can draw, you know, that couldn't draw a good illustration for my music. I mean, I, I definitely think that there are artists out there who would definitely be able to do a really good job doing it. It's just not the point. The point is, is that I've got the skill necessary to do it, and I envision certain pictures in my head when I'm writing my music. So if I want to get that image exactly, that and if I can do it myself, then I will. Okay. Um, it's not it's not something that I have trouble doing. It's uh, something I can do while I'm writing the music and while I'm recording it, and I can get it done. And not only does the image come out looking the way I want it to, it adds sort of an extra touch to the music as well. So that's something that I. I like to keep consistent with. Okay, okay. Um, so, what kind of drawing software do you use? I used to use Photoshop. I don't use that anymore because I discovered Paint Tool SAI. Oh, Paint Tool um, SAI. Yeah, uh, Paint Tool SAI is a great program and uh, one of my favorites, and uh, I use it all the time. I use Photoshop sometimes for some small things that SAI can't do, but uh, it's a program that I use, and I use a uh, Wacom 4x4 uh, bamboo tablet which i'm probably going to replace soon because it's kind of old it's a 2008 model so uh i'm thinking of replacing that soon so i can you know get a little more inspiration for my productivity while i'm drawing and uh that's pretty much what i use um like i said if there's any if there's any one thing i could change about what i have i'd probably want to change my tablet because it's old and i'd like an upgrade that's pretty Mm -hmm. much it well i see your art is really good and well an upgrade you deserve an upgrade (laughs) seriously you Mm -hmm. deserve an upgrade so thank you (laughs) Uh, there's a lot of things here. I mean, um, one thing I'm, that's bothering me is, why don't you have an avatar for your Divine Art account? Uh, that's a recent thing. And, uh, yeah, I'd rather not get into why that that's all the way, you know, why my Divine Art page is the way it is now. <laughs> uh, okay, it's cool, it's cool. And the name, you want to talk about it or should we just leave it alone? Matt Tackable? Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of like how I explained it before. Matt Tackable is just a play on my real name, which is Matt, and it's been my uh, internet um, alias for as long as I could. Well, not as far as long as I could remember. Back when I was, you know, kind of first dwell on the internet, I had I had gone under an internet alias that I hated um, because I constantly got ridiculed for it because it was a really fruity name. And at some point during that time, I I, I got onto a game of TF2. And, well, no, it wasn't TF2. It was Left for Dead. Okay. And. Uh, People were ridiculing me for the name. They were like, get out of here. And, you know, they were insulting me and everything like that. And I was like, all right, it's time for a new name. <laughs> and I was like, I can't take this anymore. So I, I sat down and I was like, I need a new internet name. It just needs to happen now. So I sat down. I thought about it. And I was like, what's what's my new name? And then I was like, my name's Matt. I, I have to work off of that somehow, I guess. So I said, Matt Tackable, like attackable, except Matt Tackable. And I thought, all right, yeah, sure, that'll be my name. And then I, that, that was it. There was absolutely no meaning behind the name. It was a hash together name so that people stopped ridiculing me on uh, the internet. 
But actually, what's really funny is that immediately after I created the name, fun, funny, you know, funny enough, I got onto Left for Dead again, and the first place I went into, the first, uh, the first group I joined, immediately made fun of my name. <laughs> Oh and God! I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" And it went as far as to everybody in the Left 4 Dead group changing their name to something Ackable, Attackable, <laughs> Mackable, Mattackable, or whatever. Everybody changed their name to that. And it was really confusing, and it was it was it only happened once. And I have a feeling it was because they probably knew that it was me. <laughs> um. So uh, that was it was entertaining, but. Uh, it was also like you've got to be kidding me, kind of thing. But uh, it never happened after that again. The only thing that happens now with that name is that people confuse it. Uh, they're like, "Oh, they're like, hey, Mackable," and I'm like, "It's not Mackable. It's Matt Tackable. There's a T there." You know, so the name gets confusing to people. But um, I mean, other than that, you know, pe- you know, sometimes pe- people have given me the nickname Mata, M A T A, because it's short for Matt Tackable, and. Normally, only my closer friends call me that because they've known me before this whole DB Pony fiasco, and uh, it's the name that they know me by the most. Oh, so okay. sometimes you might see me see somebody call me Mata, M A T A, or Matt Tacky, which is another <laughs> little nickname that got attached to me. <laughs> so if you see anybody ever calling me that, it's either because they knew me from my art first, which is the first thing I started doing before the music, or because they're a close friend that they just happened to know my internet alias before DB Pony. Okay, awesome, awesome. I was just confused because if I remember right, you link uh, a DeviantArt page to your music saying, um, here is the picture in the music. And I click the link and, huh, it's Metacable. Huh, who is this person? Okay, this person draws art for DB Pony. All right, okay, awesome. And Metacable is to DB Pony as glaze is to wooden, to- is, is to wooden <laughs> toaster. It's the best way to look at it. Yeah. And it's both- just an alternate alias. For me, it was confusing at first, but once I discovered that you drew it yourself, it even uh, it impressed me even more. <laughs> I mean, it's not only that you can draw, you can play music. Oh, awesome, awesome. The character DB Pony, it's a unicorn. So why pick a unicorn? Because it was the cool thing to do at the time. <laughs> <laughs> really? I, I really have, like, no, uh, I have no excuse, really. I, I didn't want to be an Earth Pony because... I didn't want the character to be an Earth Pony because everybody else was being Earth Pony because everyone else was like, oh, well, being a Pegasus or being a unicorn is so OP. And I was like, all right, well, you guys are, you know, being ridiculous. So you go off and be, you know, your Earth Ponies. And I didn't want to be a Pegasus because that seemed like the obvious choice. Well, I could fly! You know, it's like, that's great. Whatever. And so I thought, ah, you know, being a unicorn, it's kind of cool because, you know, the character's going to be creating music and it's kind of a magical thing anyway. So, and then I was like, all right, and I, you know, put a horn on him and that was pretty much it. <laughs> okay, cool. Because um, the song Wonderball, it makes even more uh, sense. And, well, since you said that if you believe in yourself and try hard to get what you want, you might get it. And uh, a unicorn becoming a Wonderbolt, that's rare. It was a far out there concept, and it, uh, it's funny to say the least. Because, I mean, in a lot of my, in a lot of the, in, in a lot of the pictures that I, that I draw of DB, you know, for DB Pony, and, you know, the music, I try to get my character in there somehow. And for Wonderbolt, I just thought the only way my character can be in there is if, you know, someone's holding me up. And Prince, whatever. <laughs> is singing in the song. So I thought, hey, well, I want to feature his character in the picture too. And I thought, ah, he's, he's going to be carrying TV pony. That's it. It just makes it funny. So yes, you know, believing yourself, believing yourself to accomplish anything. Yeah, that's great. But there's no way my character could ever be a wonder bowl. And by him being up in the sky, you know, crying his eyeballs, that was a bit foolish of him. So in hindsight, he didn't enjoy it. And I'm pretty sure he's not going to be a wonder bowl and he's got to change a heart now. So. <laughs> uh, there's a first time for everything. Yeah, there is. And there's also a last time for everything. <laughs> It's true indeed, true indeed. So, uh, well, I have to say you do great music, you do great art. Um, what else can I ask you? Um, um, what kind of tools do you use to record your music? What kind of tools? Yeah. Uh, I'm a wizard, you see. <laughs> oh my. I put on my robe and wizard hat when I when I get to create music. So, it's like, get ready to do it, and then I it just happens. Oh. I, uh, I use a lot of equipment. And because I work at a music store, I'm, it's I have a lot of the... I have a lot of access to some pretty good equipment that I could buy and that I could use. 
So I'm very fortunate in that aspect. It's all readily available for me if I need it, and it's all there at a at a good price. So it's uh, it's very easy for me to get a hold of good equipment to record with. So I'm very fortunate in that area. Uh, I have right now. I, I just bought a new guitar, by the way. Awesome. So I have more. I have more instruments now. I have uh, four guitars. I have a uh, classical guitar, which I just bought, an acoustic guitar, and two electric guitars, and I have three electric basses. I have quite a few amps over here. I have a guitar amp. Uh, it's, a t- it's an orange amp. It's a tiny terror amp. It's a really, really good amp. I have a couple of PV bass amps, and then I have my uh, my recording equipment, which is a um, stuff that I need to upgrade at some point because I- I'm not really enjoying the interface that I use right now. I use a uh, M- I use an M Audio Fast Track Pro, which is something I really need to upgrade from because it's, it's an old audio interface, and I could be recording way better quality stuff if I had something new. It's something I've been putting off. And then I have a uh, a mic preamp. I have a Golden Age Pre seventy three MK two. It's a really good preamp. And then I've got a pair of KRK Rocket Five studio monitors, and those are pretty good for mixing. And then I've got my computer, which I built by myself. You know, all that good stuff. Oh, awesome. Um, do I only understand the monitors and some of them because, like I said, I'm not a music guy. My music guys went off on duty with parents. Ugh, I wish I had some music guy with me right now because I'm kind of not the right person to ask you musical stuff. Uh, drawing stuff I can handle, but uh, other stuff than that I can't. I'm sorry if I'm not asking you interesting questions. No, oh, so you're asking questions that are fine. Don't worry about it. So, um, for your 4,000 subscribers, you did a cover of Escape from the City. So, how did that one came along? I really liked the song, and I've always wanted to cover it. Talking to a couple of friends about it, and they thought it'd be a good idea. And I was like, you're right. It is a good idea. I knew it was a great idea. That's why I'm going to do it. And that was it. Awesome, because <laughs> I, I like the song. And, well... I've heard the song before, I like it, but your cover is really good. I had a lot of fun doing it. It was a, it was a real joy covering that song. It's a song that I really liked during my uh, my younger ye- my younger teenage years, and uh, it's a sound that's always stuck with me because I, really, I like that that kind of get-ready-to-kick-ass kind of kind of sound. I kind of like that music, and I was a big fan of Sonic back then. So. Oh, same here, same here. I didn't get the chance to play um, Adventures. Is it Adventures? Sonic Adventures? Or is it Sonic Advance? No, sorry. Adventures. Advance the Game Boy. There's been a lot of different new Sonic games. I played one and I hated it and then I got turned off. So. <laughs> you mean Sonic 1 or... I don't know. I, Sonic Adventure 1 was okay. Was, you know, back then it was the best thing in the world to me. But, you know, now if I, if I replay it, it probably sucks. Yeah. Uh, Sonic Adventure 2 was great. I liked that a lot. Uh, Sonic Heroes was the next game I played after that. And that game was terrible. <laughs> and uh, after that, I stopped. I was like, I can't do this. My, the game franchise has been done. It's, yeah. it's dead to me now. Oh, you should try Generations. I heard Generations was good. I hear lots of things. Like voices in my head. <laughs> No, but seriously, um, if you really want to try and play a Sonic game, try Generations. It's uh, an homage to the old and new Sonic. Mm-hmm. I've heard that. Yeah. Well, um, don't take my word for it. If you want, you can rent it out. But eh, it's up to you. I'm trying mm-hmm. to find it and it's sold out everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh. Mm-hmm. So I think those are my questions. Um, DB, do you have any questions for me? Mm-hmm. Did you enjoy this experience? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, enjoying a solo recording with no one to back me up. Um, I'll say it's interesting. Uh, enjoyable? Um, I won't say that I enjoy it, but it's interesting. <laughs> anyway, that was DB Pony. Thanks for coming on, DB. I wish I was a better host to ask you all the hard-hitting questions, but ah, I suck at my job. I know. You're oh. just uh, you're just your worst critic right now. You did a good job. Don't worry about it. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That means a lot coming from you. <laughs> so before I sign off, where could anyone find you online? You can find me on YouTube. If you go to uh, YouTube, you type in DB Pony. I'm normally the first thing that comes up if you type type in DBP. Or you can find me on Tumblr, where I interact with every single question that is put in my box. You go to DB Pony dbpony dot tumblr dot com, which brings you to my Tumblr. You can follow that for updates. 
You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm not on there a lot, and I'm trying to still use Twitter, so bear with me if I don't really do anything on there. You can find me at dbpony on twitter.com. You can find me on my DeviantArt, which is not tackable, which is currently not active right now. And you can find me on Facebook. I have a DB Pony on a, I have a DB Pony account on Facebook. You can go there, you can like it, throw me messages or anything you want over there. Absolutely fine with that. I am more active on Tumblr than I am on any of those websites. So if you really want to get on me, you go to Tumblr. It's the best awesome, place to find awesome. me. I, I'll link everything in the show notes. And I just thought of one more question, silly me. Uh-huh. Um, how long does it take for you to start and finish a song, including the pictures? I try to give it a month. Oh, so with, uh, with its, it doesn't take me a month to make the music. Collectively, it might take the effort of uh, a day, twenty four hours basically to complete, you know, a song. Because what happens with the time that I invest in the song is, uh, I work forty four hours a week at my job. Oh my! I barely, I, I barely get enough time to really do do the things that I need to all in one sitting. So I have to spread it out between my days off, and I have to spread it out between uh, some hour free hours that I get when I get home from work so with the hours that i the labor that i put into it collectively might take a day or two for me to complete a song do the picture and all that kind of good stuff so it's really spread out and i spread it out through the period of one month because that's pretty much how much time i want to invest in a song and make sure it's 120 percent i could release things faster but i don't believe in quantity over quality and i want to make sure the things are the best as they can be and i think one song per month is a good uh it's a good consistency to follow. Although I am uh, unfortunately going to say that I don't think there is going to be a song for February due Aww. to uh, some things that I have to prioritize first. So uh, uh, it's something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, March, there will be a song for March. So, uh, And I'm also going to be attending conventions. Ooh, which conventions are you going? One thing that I should mention. Uh, I'm going to be attending CloudCon March, ah. which is in Washington, D.C., so it'll be my first convention. I'll also be at Sweet Apple Acres in uh, I forget what it was. I think it was July or June. One of those. I'll also be at BronyCon, and uh, there might be a couple others I'm going to be attending. So there are a couple of conventions you'll be able to meet me at if you're going. So yeah. Awesome, because we recently had um, Forest Rain and uh, Starborn on. Um, Starborn was one of the chairs for Cloudsdale Con. Yep, I know both of them very well, and I'll be meeting them there. Awesome. Are you going to perform live then? I am going to be doing an acoustic performance. Yes, I will be performing. Oh, awesome, awesome. And BronyCon, will you be performing live there too? Do not want to say yes or no to that yet. My application has been put in. Let's just say there is a 99% chance that you will see me there for more than just a visit. All right, awesome, awesome. So I think those were my questions, and I will link everything in the show notes for people to find you. So let's move on to the next topic, and the next topic is shout-outs. So my shout-out goes to you, DB. Thank you for being on and tolerating my derpiness. (laughs) There was hardly anything that I had to tolerate with more effort than I usually put in with my normal social interactions, so do not worry about being derpy. You are absolutely flawless. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, what about you, DB? Anyone to shout out to? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'd like to give a shout out to my good friend and mentor and partner in crime, Paleo Steno, because he is a very good friend of mine. And uh, I think he helped boost my confidence to do what I'm doing now. And he's a, he's a great 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 friend and i really can't wait to meet him very long time friend of mine knew him way before any of his brony stuff and very very good kid kind-hearted i i really love him i I can't wait to meet him one day uh big shout out to him uh saber spark for being awesome being there for me and uh just being a uh, a funny guy to, to be around i i absolutely love him who else um ellie monty I did gush over her a lot during this episode. I I will give her another shout-out, because she's just a sweetheart. Yeah, Ellie Monty, fantastic. Love her. Uh, And uh, any of my other friends that have led me throughout this musical journey and this, you know, this cascade of colorful ponies and everything, you know, I I love every single one of them, and they've, they've all taught me something, you know, at one point or another, some lessons more valuable to my life than the other. So, yes... 
lots of shout outs. And, uh, I mean, if I haven't mentioned them, that doesn't mean that they're any less relevant to my life than to the people that I've shouted out. So yes, thank you everybody. It's, uh, it's been quite the ride and I'm, uh, still on the roller coaster. So stay tuned for a lot of stuff. And, uh, personally for me, I'll be expecting good things from you. <laughs> they can only get better. So it's true, lots to true. come. Thank you, DB. Thank you once again for coming onto the show. And if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, or you, if you just want to talk to us, you can email us at the MBS show at gmail.com and Twitter. You can contact us on Twitter. The show's Twitter account is at the MBS show. I'm at Norman Sanzo. And DB, you said you got a Twitter, right? I do have a Twitter, yes. I do. Uh, it's twitter.com slash dbpony, right? Yes. Alright, and also please subscribe and rate us on iTunes and also like our Facebook page. Um, links will be provided in the show notes. So I've been Norman Sanzo. And I'm, hi, I'm DB Pony. <laughs> and DB Pony, you said you're going to take us out, right? Yes, you've, uh, you've asked me to perform a song, so I'm going to do so. <laughs> yes, thank you. And what song shall that be? It's going to be Wonderbolt, the recent song that I've, um, that I've released. It's uh, all too suiting to lead out with, so... All right, should, and uh, the stage is all yours. And mm-hmm. before that, see you later, guys. Thank you for being on, DB. You're welcome. DB, mind introducing yourself to the people who might not know you or know what you do? I sell drugs <laughs> and uh, 
do some late night dealing, you know. No, I'm a, I am a young adult who lives in New York and writes music, and just so happened to write music based off of the My Little Pony franchise. <laughs>